Edward was still back there talking, so I thought it was too early to get started, but that's liable to just keep going on, so we better better start anyway. We'll get a daily Bible reader count if you're a daily Bible reader. Raise your hand. And does anybody need a quarterly? We got any extra? Anybody need one? All right. Johnny, would you mind leading us in a, a word of prayer before we get started? When Mike finishes counting, we don't want to mess him up. Thank you, John. Two or three weeks ago, I was uh, picking up the girls at Papa's daycare, and uh, when when you when you pull out of my in-laws' driveway, uh, my brother-in-law JD has got some donkeys there in a pasture, and he's probably got four or five on a lot where he really needs two or three, but that's another discussion. And as we were pulling out of the driveway, they just went wild braying at us and just making all kinds of, of racket and uh, really loud and so I, I hollered back there to the girls in the back seat and said now girls the donkeys are telling us bye y'all need to say bye to the donkeys and uh, Scarlett in her three-year-old wisdom said daddy donkeys can't talk <laughs> and I said well Uncle JD's don't talk because they can't get a word in edgewise and if y'all know my brother-in-law, you know there's some truth to that. Uh, but our lesson this morning involves a talking donkey. And uh, it's more than a talking donkey. That, that's what kind of gets our attention about the story. But it's really about a man and his desire to serve God on one hand, but his desire to serve the world and for worldly riches on the other hand, and how those two desires seem to compete with each other. And that's something I think a lot of us struggle with. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we all probably have that struggle of, on the one hand, I want to do what God wants me to do, but on the other hand, I really kind of want to do some of the things the world wants me to do also. And Balaam, who's the character we're, we're mainly looking at this morning, struggled with that. Now, to set the, the story for you, as you enter Numbers 22, which is where our lesson is, the Israelites are camped... In the, in the plains of Moab. And they have defeated some, some other nations on their way to the promised land. And uh, the Moabites are really afraid because they've heard what Israel has done to the Amorites. They know that uh, Jehovah God is, is watching over the Israelites. And so they're really nervous to see this huge nation all of a sudden camped out in their land. And they're afraid that maybe they're next. Now, God had told Israel, leave the Moabites alone. You're not going to attack the Moabites. If you read in Deuteronomy, you'll read about him telling Israel, you're not going to attack the Moabites. Uh, but either the Moabites didn't realize that God had said that or didn't believe that Israel was going to, going to follow through on that because they were very afraid. In fact, in verse 3, it says, Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. And so Balak the king goes and finds this prophet named Balaam. And he asks that Balaam come down and curse Israel. Because evidently Balaam had a reputation of who he cursed. Things kind of went bad for that, those people. And who he blessed, things went good for those people. And so Balak the king sent for Balaam the prophet to come and curse Israel. And uh, Balaam gave a pretty good response, basically say, saying that I, I've got to hear what God says on the matter. Before I can do anything, I've got to listen to what God says and, and hear what he says. 
And in verse 12 of Numbers 22, God gives his answer. And the answer was, God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balak had sent this group of people to come and bring Balaam back so that he could curse Israel. And God gives a pretty simple to understand answer. You can't go. And you can't curse the people because they are blessed. So, so word gets back to uh, Balak, the king, and he evidently thinks that maybe this is a money issue. And maybe he didn't send enough money the first time because he had sent money to Balaam the first time to get him to come and do this. And so he gets it in his mind, maybe, maybe he wants more. Maybe Balaam's holding out for more money, and so I'm going to offer that. And that's kind of where our lesson picks up in Numbers 22. So we'll read a, uh, a few of the verses, uh, beginning in verse 15. Balak again sent princes, more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I spoke to you, that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. This Balaam character is kind of hard to, to figure out because he says some things that sound pretty good. And in, in this passage that we've read so far, he says, I, I don't care what you offer me, I can't go uh, and do this unless God says it's okay. That's what he says. But what he does is invite the people, the delegation that had come to him, to stick around for a little while. Stick around and let's see if God changes his mind. It's essentially what, he, what he's doing. Because when you, when you get to studying Balaam, you realize that he really wanted to go curse Israel. And it wasn't necessarily anything personal between him and Israel, but he was a man of greed. And we'll look at some passages from the New Testament that point that out. So rather than just listen to what God said, uh, when God was pretty clear, you can't go, you can't curse Israel... Now he's saying, well, I can only say what God says I can, but let's just hang around and, and see if God might change his mind. He's sort of like a kid, you know. When I, when I, before I was a parent, I knew a lot more about parenting than I do now. And one of the things that I knew is that when you tell a kid no, that kid should listen. That kid should not keep asking you, can I do this? That kid shouldn't go to your wife and say, can I do this? That kid should, should understand you said no, and that means no, and that'd be the end of it. That's what I knew. Now I know that that's not reality. At least it's not my reality. Now, your kids may be different, but my kids, when I tell them no, occasionally might listen, but most of the time it's, well, why not? But, but I want to. Oh, I've heard, but I want to more times than I can, can remember. Balaam's thought process was, but I want to. All right, I know God has said no, but I want to. Now, he says the right things. He says, I can only speak what God tells me I can speak, but I want to, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if God changes his mind. And it, it sort of appears God changes his mind, or at least that might be what we, we think when we see that, because God says, all right, Balaam, go ahead. But he also says, don't say anything other than what I've told you to. And, and God hasn't really changed his mind, but God does give us free will. And he gave Balaam the free will to go, but he does give that caveat, don't do anything other than what I've told you to. So let's continue reading in our lesson. We'll pick up in verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him, and he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. 
Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on the side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way left to turn to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you, that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden? Ever since I became yours to this day, was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from the... From me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So it's kind of an interesting little story there because not only does the donkey speak to Balaam, Balaam speaks back to the donkey and, and it doesn't really seem that concerned that, hey, there's this animal talking to him. And, and they have a conversation. So you kind of wonder, did he know that he was speaking or that, that God had a hand in this as he's having this conversation with his donkey? And, and, and three different times, uh, seeing the angel of the Lord, the donkey tries to, to get Balaam's attention, uh, first by going out into the field, and, and when he couldn't do that, by kind of pushing up against the wall when it was so narrow they could barely, uh, barely get through, and then finally when he couldn't do anything else, just laying down. And uh, one of the commentaries I looked at kind of made the point that the deeper you get into sin, the harder it is to get back. Uh, you know, and, and the farther he went down this road, it seems like the more narrow things got uh, for him. You know, the first the donkey goes into the field, and then the donkey kind of goes against the wall, and finally, when the donkey couldn't do anything else, just laid down. And uh, they they made the point that as we go deeper into sin, uh, eventually we get to the point where we can't do anything but either press forward and keep going deeper, or turn completely around and go back towards God, which I thought was a pretty good point. Uh, but Balaam. Uh, what I notice about this, he seems very eager to get to Balak, doesn't he? Uh, he's, he's beating on this poor donkey, uh, not understanding that the donkey is saving his life by not allowing him to be killed by, by the angel of the Lord, and uh, makes sort of an ironic statement to the donkey that uh, if I had a sword, I'd kill you. Uh, it's ironic because the angel of the Lord had a sword drawn, ready to kill Balaam, and he didn't even realize that that was going on. Now, uh, I don't think his eagerness uh, was because he was eager to get to Balak uh, so he could only speak the word of the Lord. I think his eagerness was because he was greedy and he fully intended to do whatever he wanted to do, regardless of what he said. And the, way I, the reason I think that is because look what the angel says uh, to him in verse 32. Behold, I have come to, out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. Despite what Balaam said about, hey, I'm only going to talk about, I'm only going to speak what God says, the angel knew his true intentions. God knew 
his true intentions because God knew the kind of man that Balaam was. And the New Testament mentions the kind of man that Balaam was. Let's turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. Beginning in 15 of 2 Peter 2, Peter is talking about false teachers. And that's the context of these verses uh, is a discussion about false teachers. And Peter says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. Peter recognized that uh, Balaam, his issue was a love of money. He wanted the wages of unrighteousness. That's why he was so eager to get to Balak. It wasn't that he was in a hurry to get there to do God's will. He fully intended to curse Israel despite what he said. And, and turn, let's turn and look at uh, John chapter 12. Because I think there's a, a comparison to be made here in John chapter 12. Verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, even among the Pharisees, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now remember what how Balak had enticed Balaam. I'm going to give you riches and I'm going to make you know. Okay, I'm going to make you somebody. I'm going to honor you greatly. That, 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 that is the paradox. That is the, the conflict that I think Balaam has internally is I want to serve God. And I think he really, really did want to serve God. But boy, he wanted the praise of men. He wanted to be honored uh, and also made wealthy by men. And so he had this conflict. Uh, and, and what he said didn't always match how he acted. Uh, he, he reminds me uh, somewhat of the Pharisees that were mentioned here in John chapter 12. Uh, if you look at Luke chapter 11... <laughs> In verse 39, what Jesus says about the Pharisees, uh, the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Outside, Balaam said the right things. He looked uh, like he was wanting to do God's will, but inside he struggled with wanting the wages of unrighteousness. You know, the Pharisees, Jesus talked about them in Matthew 23 again, and, and the scribes also, and over and over he pronounced those woes upon them, and he compared them to a whitewashed tomb that on the outside is, is adorned and very pretty and looked good, but on the inside it was full of what? Dead men's bones. And on the outside, Balaam says the right things, but on the inside... His actions don't match up to what he says. And uh, there's a lesson I think is pretty obvious to all of us that we can fall into that same trap where we say the right things and try to give off the appearance of being a faithful Christian, but our actions don't always match up to what we say. Uh, in Numbers 23, after this, this incident with the donkey, Balaam praise a prayer that I think again shows the paradox of this, of this man. In uh, verse 10 of Numbers 23, he says, Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. That's a pretty good prayer. Uh, you know, that's a prayer that we would probably do well to to pray ourselves. I want to die the death of the righteous. You know, that prayer, I think he realizes that death is, is real. Uh, and, and we're told in various passages in the scriptures that death is something we're not going to be able to avoid. Uh, 
he recognized in that prayer that there is a difference in dying the death of the righteous versus dying the death of the unrighteous. Uh, Jesus talked about that in uh, Matthew 25. He said, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That there's, a, there's a difference. And Balaam wanted to die that death of the righteous. Um, it's important. Jesus, uh, again, in Mark 8, says, What will it profit a man if he go, gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So that prayer, again, it, it's, it makes a lot of sense. It sounds really good. But to die the death of the righteous, what do you have to do? You've got to live the life of the righteous, right? We can't live the life of the unrighteous and then expect to die the death of the righteous. And that seems to be what Balaam was trying to do. Um, he, he had the desire to go to heaven, but he didn't have the determination to get there. Sort of like the rich young ruler that Jesus talked to. The rich young ruler came and, hey, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? I really, I want to go to heaven. And Jesus tells him some commandments he needs to follow. Oh, I've done all those things since I was, since I was young. Well, there's one thing you're missing. Because he knew that the rich young ruler's riches were between him and having a good relationship with God. Get rid of that stuff, paraphrasing obviously. Get rid of your stuff. Come and follow me. And the rich young ruler went away, went away sorrowful because he had a lot of stuff that he didn't want to get rid of. And he was... He was willing to keep that between him and God. And uh, it seems like Balaam had some of that same, that same uh, issue. Let's look at another uh, New Testament scripture that, that talks about Balaam. Jude, verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Uh, the riches of the world can, uh, can certainly get in our way. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 is a passage we've, we've read many times, but I think it's worth looking at again. Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you skip down to verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I, and I think that's what Balaam tried to do. If you continue reading about Balaam, uh, what you'll find is in uh, Numbers chapter 25, uh, God punishes Israel very severely for some, some idolatry and for intermarrying with the harlots in Moab of that country that Balak was king over. And he punishes them, and uh, I think it was 24, yeah, 24,000 perished in that punishment. And you say, well, what does that have to do with Balaam? Well, if you continue reading and get to Numbers 31, uh, verse 16, it says, Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So Balaam, uh, when he wasn't able to curse the children of Israel because God wouldn't allow it, he still found a way to seduce Israel to sin, to help the Moabites, to help King Balak seduce Israel into sin. And you see the kind of man that he was. Uh, that he said the right things, but he didn't do the right things. And ultimately, it cost him his life. And again, in chapter 31, we find uh, Balaam, in verse 8, Balaam, the son of Beor, 
they also killed with the sword. The Israelites killed Balaam uh, because he was fighting on the side of the Midianites. He, he had completely uh, crossed over and was fighting against God and against the children of Israel. And uh, I think he's an interesting study because, uh, like, like any of us can fall into, wanted to do what was right, said the right things, uh, but wanted the riches and, and the things of the world more than he wanted to serve God. Sorry I didn't uh, slow down enough for any, any kind of comments, but uh, any, anybody got anything? Well, I certainly appreciate you being here and your uh, good attention. Thank you all.